dancing. Good to have you all here. Have a seat. It's uh, opportunity time to get to know each other and have all this great networking going on. Now, I hate to break it up with a little thing like lunch, but we don't want to miss that. Welcome, everybody. How about that beautiful day outside? Isn't it wonderful? A little frost on the pumpkin. We're glad that you took time to be here. We have a great crowd today to hear Doug Rothwell. I thought uh, before we get started, we might begin just be, um, with a little bit of an opportunity to return thanks and to have a moment uh, just to reflect on just how awesome it is to be here in Lansing on a beautiful day like this. Let's just take a moment, please. Well, very good. Thanks again for being here. While I have your attention, could we just do one thing real quick? There's a bunch of MSU students here that are going to be taking care of you. I predict that your food will come out faster if you really give them a big round of applause to thank them for their time. Thank you. We're grateful for the uh, center here and all that they do for us to host this great event. It's so good to see so much of Lansing uh, out today and to see s uh, such a great crowd. Doug, that's a tribute to you and what you're going to share with us today. There's so many wonderful things. We talk about innovation and leading Michigan and bringing it uh, to the best it can possibly be. And the business leaders here today uh, help us in every regard uh, to help us do that. And I want to I wanna say that this particular series would not be possible if it wasn't for our sponsors. So for today, I'd like to uh, thank today's program sponsor. Would you please join me in thanking McLaren Greater Health of Lansing. Our entire series is underwritten by MidMichigan Business Travel Coalition. Let's thank them for their continued support and excellent, excellent support. And we also want to thank Message Makers for the support of our audio uh, and video equipment. They're back here and they make this all happen. Thank you very much to Message Makers. We've got a fantastic program for you. We hope that you enjoy it. Uh, we look forward to uh, rejoining right after a delicious lunch. So enjoy your lunch. We'll be right back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have, to, uh, I have to interrupt again, and I apologize for that. We have a pressing matter that I want to make sure that we clear up. With all of this leadership in the room, we have a vexing question. Can anybody answer the, the, the question, why is chocolate mousse better than chocolate pudding? I don't know. It's pretty good, though, right? Did you, was your meal good? How was your service? How about the uh, staff here? Well, we, have, uh, we want to get on with our program. I'm so excited about our speaker today. But before that, we want to hear from our, our uh, host and our uh, uh, program supporters and sponsors, the Mid-Michigan Business uh, uh, Travel Coalition. And we have the wonderful and very talented Paula Cunningham, who is the uh, director for AARP across the state of Michigan. Please do me the honor and welcome Paula Cunningham. Go green! Yes. All right, thank you for that. That kind of pumped me up anyway. Our region received some wonderful news in the past month. As many of you may have heard, American Airlines has been granted, had been granted permission to continue operating direct service from Lansing to Washington, D.C. until October of next year, which was nice. However, just a couple of weeks ago, we received word that the U.S. Department of Transportation has given American permission to continue operating another four years until October 2023. Woohoo! That allows for continuation of the Washington, D.C. service, direct service, and we'll keep American in our market as one of our three legacy carriers, along with Delta and United. Not bad for Lansing. Congratulations to Wayne Seeloth and the team at Capital Regional International Airport for this fabulous job. 
And one of the priorities of the team at the airport, yeah, give them a round of applause. Give them a can. They did a wonderful job. Thank you. One of the priorities that the team at the airport is working very hard on is to improve the overall customer experience at the airport. A very exciting customer upgrade is in the works. Lansing Brewing Company, thank you Pat Gillespie, has announced plans to partner with the airport and open a restaurant bar on the second floor of the terminal. Yes, restaurant bar, so you can go early and stay late. LBC should be open for business next spring, and the airport also has exciting plans for customer amenities in the terminal, all of which will be completed by 2019. More good reasons to fly Lansing. The airport has another opportunity for you to register for TSA PreCheck. Anyone in here who flies and is not registered for PSA PreCheck, TSA PreCheck, you really need to consider doing that. Signups are being offered the week of November 12th. You will want to pre-register, which you can go to identical.com. That's I-D-E-N-T-I, go.com. Uh, you also cost us only $85, but that's good for five years. And when you're standing in line, you would give somebody $85 to get out of line. So five years isn't bad. <laughs> Finally, Apple's vacation is back. That means winter is here, and they have nonstop international service for those family vacations and long weekends, and the schedule runs from December 22nd through April 1st. You've got a lot of time to start planning, but do it now. Cancun, Mexico departs on Thursdays through Sundays. Punta Cana, Dominican Republic departs Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. And Montego Bay, Jamaica departs every Friday. Now it is my pleasure to introduce one of Lansing's finest CEOs, Kirk Ray, who is president and CEO of McLaren Greater Lansing, who is sponsor of today's program, and he will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Fly Lansing. <laughs> wow, finest CEOs, uh, all of five months here in the Lansing community, and I can honestly say uh, I've had a, a phenomenal welcome from everybody in the community. I've had the opportunity the last six years to have operational responsibilities for over 40 healthcare markets in seven states. And I think the thing, I, today I was overwhelmed when I walked in, I, out, of the, out of all those different healthcare markets and the communities I've been involved in, this community is, is phenomenal when it comes to supporting the success of, econ of its own economy and economic development. And, and it's, it's evident today that it's paying dividends with all of the investments that are continuing to happen now and into the future. And I will tell you that, uh, here's my commercial, uh, McLaren made an announcement last year to invest over $500 million in this community for the future of health care and, and the uh, reinventment of health care in collaboration with Michigan State. And we're proud to be, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Having come from a market recently that did something very similar, I can tell you that it was a catalyst not just for the city but for the entire region. Uh, into the future, and so seven years from, since that investment was made in that other community is still continuing to pay dividends and yielding phenomenal results for the local economy, and I see that as an opportunity here in, in the greater Lansing market. And cut. That's my commercial. So, um, it's my opportunity today to introduce our guest speaker. Doug has worked as an executive in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors for the past decade. He's led business leaders from Michigan, a business roundtable of corporate CEOs from the state's largest companies working to grow jobs and the state's economy. He's worked for four governors in two states. In the business world, he managed General Motors' 400 million square foot global real estate portfolio and was the CAO at Bank of America's credit card subsidiary. In Michigan, Doug chairs both the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and the American Center for Mobility. In North Carolina, Doug serves in various roles for his alma mater at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, including chair of the Board of Visitors and a member of the Board of Advisors for UNC Athletics and the Chancellor's Philanthropic Council. Doug graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with a Master's of Public Administration degree, the Uni University of Delaware with a Bachelor of Arts degree, and the Harvard University John F. Kennedy School Program for Senior Executives in State and Local Government. He's a former Presidential Management Fellow and has received the most prestigious honors awarded by the National Governors Association and the Michigan Economic Development Association and University of Delaware for his public service. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Doug Rothwell to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. 
It's so great to back to be here. First of all, I have to brag on uh, Tim Damon. I, I don't get a chance to do this very often, Tim, but you, you all know that you've got probably the best regional chamber director in Michigan, if not America, and you're so lucky to have him. The man, the man. Tim is the man, and uh, the other thing is, is that you know, I just wanted to share with you because I don't get a chance to do this very often. There's so many folks in this room that I know, and uh, you know, this was my home until I moved to Ann Arbor a few years back. But I will tell you, the reason I'm in Michigan is because of Lansing. Uh, I came here. I told Tim uh, the first trip I made here 25 years ago when I was recruited by John Engler. It was a really lousy gray winter. January day in Lansing, and you know what those look like. They're not, you know, they're not the chamber poster child for <laughs> attracting folks. But uh, my wife and I came here, and uh, we fell in love with the people, um, uh, and it was uh, a great move. And we've been here ever since. So uh, you got a lot going for you, and I, I'm I'm pleased to be be part of this community. So today, what I'd like to do is to uh, kind of give you a little bit of a um, a talk about why I think, we think at Business Leaders for Michigan, we are at a crossroads again. Uh, not unlike we were maybe seven or eight years ago when uh, we were coming out of that awful great recession and we were questioning ourselves back then, you know, whether we were going to have a, a state that our kids were going to be willing to live in, whether we were going to be willing to, and able to stay here. And uh, I'm not sure it's quite that severe again, but it is certainly uh, more along those lines than we've seen perhaps uh, in a while. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of the organization that I represent, uh, what we do, a little bit about the Michigan economy, uh, what we see at least in terms of how we stack up to a lot of our competitors, and then uh, speak about uh, what we think maybe the priorities should be moving forward, especially with an election coming up and uh, maybe what you can do uh, to help out with that cause. So let's, you know, first of all, Business Leaders for Michigan is uh, what we call the state's business roundtable. There are about 25 states that have organizations like ours that are made up of the CEOs or the most senior people of the largest companies in Michigan. There's only about 80 members, but those 80 members represent about a third of the state's economy, about 400,000 Michigan employees, um, and representing about a trillion dollars worth of revenue. So even though we're not a very big organization, we have a really, uh, I think, a pretty good feel for what's going on in Michigan economically. What we do is pretty straightforward. We spend a lot of time trying to gather facts and data around uh, not only Michigan, but what our competitors around the country and around the world are doing that are improving their economy. And we try to take that and put that into uh, strategies that we think can move Michigan forward, try to share that information with the public so that it's not just uh, us working for those issues, but we get a lot of other folks pulling in the direction as well. We then advocate for policy changes uh, in the capital that we think would make a difference. And at times, we work on projects ourselves. A couple of years ago, for example, we started a big venture capital fund to try to grow entrepreneurship in the state. So we'll do some things in, that we think uh, are in our wheelhouse directly. Back when we were established in 2009, we felt that Michigan needed a, a very, very clear goal to achieve, just like you would in business. It took a very business-like approach. And we created a goal that said, we think Michigan should be aspiring to be a top 10 state. And a top 10 state specifically in terms of jobs, incomes, and what we define as a healthy economy. And the reason why we set that goal is because even today, look at the difference between where Michigan is now and what we would look like if we were a top 10 state with people earning more, uh, producing more, uh, and having more people working. These are significant numbers, and I'll share in a minute kind of how significant they are in terms of uh, what it would mean for our economy if we were performing this way. So I spoke at the beginning about being at a crossroads. And, and the reason is, is because if you, you know, you look back just those seven, eight, nine years ago, it feels really good today, right? I mean, we're not in crisis. Rome's not burning. Uh, you know, we're not in a situation where uh, we have to worry about uh, you know, whether we're going to be able to balance the budget next year or not. I mean, the reality is, is that we're in a position that I think many of us back then didn't know whether we would be able to get back to. 
But the other side of the story is, well, where actually are we and how good should we feel about this? So these are the numbers that I think really tell the story. This is the rankings of where we stood on the most important measures of economic health back in 2009 and where we are, at least as of 2016, and I will tell you the 2017 numbers are not a lot different. I don't know about you, but in business, when you rank among 50 competitors around the 30s, you shouldn't feel really good. That's not a very good place to be, especially when you're in the kind of world we live in today that is so competitive and where there are so many great places to live and so many great options that you've got, being average, which is where we are on most of these measures, is really not where we need to be and where we should be uh, based on what we have to work with in Michigan and all the assets that we have. Let me try to put these numbers in a little different perspective. So if you were thinking about just what would Michigan look like if we just maintained the share of the nation's economy that we had back in 2000, not that long ago, same share of the economy we had back then, Michigan would be producing 30% more than we are today. So think of it another way, we're producing 30% less as a share of the nation's economy than we did back in 2000. Think about it from an income standpoint. If we had people earning the same income levels, relatively speaking, as we did back in 2000, today, people would be earning in Michigan $50 billion more. Put another way, the 4% state income tax on $50 billion is $2 billion a year. That just happens to be the money we need to fix our roads permanently and sustainably. Okay, so these, it really, you can see how this loss begins to affect what you see every day around you in terms of the inability to solve some problems. Think about it another way as a business person. If we had maintained the same share of the population of the country, as we had back around the 1980s, there'd be almost two and a half million more people living in Michigan. We'd be a state of 13 million people rather than a little under 10. Three million more customers for business. $50 billion more of income to attract people to want to have jobs here. It's a reason why, in many ways, we feel at Business Leaders for Michigan, the biggest challenge Michigan has is being stuck at 10 million people. Because we're not the state that people want to come to. They don't see that there's the dynamism here that they see in other places. And business doesn't necessarily want to come to as much. Because when you come to Michigan, you've got to steal market share from entrenched players. If you go to other states that are growing faster, you don't have to necessarily have to steal market share from entrenched players. You can just say, hey, more folks coming into the state, you do business with me rather than the guy that's already here or next door. So it's a very, very serious situation that we face. We track a lot of data at our organization. And this is kind of a complicated chart, but, but the message it tries to get across is, is that of the 50 measures that we track that we think relate most to or, or most would be most indi indicative of uh, what your future economy is going to look like, uh, we look, track these and group these into different categories. And if you look over kind of on the left-hand side under what's called compete, those are the factors that we think most relate to our cost competitiveness as a state. The blue is 2009, the orange is 2016, and what you see is that we've made a lot of gains in some of those categories. Things like our tax environment, our business climate, major gains. But if you look at some of the factors that relate more to whether we're making our investments wisely and whether we are uh, really doing everything we can to deploy our assets for growth, uh, there the numbers don't look as good. It looks like, in fact, we're, we're maybe even backtracking a little bit. And this chart shows the same data, those 50 factors, just groups them a little differently. So again, looking at factors that relate to being cost competitive, wise investment strategies, really having uh, very effective growth strategies. The factors on cost competitiveness are largely at or above the national average. Green would be top 10, yellow would be above average, uh, red would be factors that are below the national average. 
Look over at investment and growth. Most of the factors there are at or below the national average. And you know, we've got some, the chart didn't come through here on this, this version, but the, the, uh, what this tries to show is, is that we've got some issues that are things that we can't necessarily control on top of all this. So growth, job growth, we think is gonna slow down here a little bit. We've had a great run for, what, seven, eight, nine years now of a national recovery, and we got a great big boost this year with tax reform, uh, which uh, turbocharged the economy even more. But that is likely not to continue for uh, the future. Not that we're going to go into a recession necessarily, but we're not going to see the same level of growth that we have. The other is, is that those factors that I talked about a minute ago in terms of the dynamism that other states have and the growth that they're experiencing is likely to continue. And Michigan has experienced that, uh, the problems from that even in the last six or seven years. This chart shows that we've lost nearly 300,000 people uh, just since 2009. Now that we've stabilized our population, but it's largely been through uh, immigration uh, that we've stabilized it as opposed to the fact that we still are experiencing net out migration for most age groups. And that's likely to continue because this chart shows that the darker blue areas are the areas that are expected to grow the most in the future. And you see that most of those are in the southeast and southwest and not as many uh, places here in Michigan. So what we try to do is to take all this data, crunch it all together, and try to come up with a plan or a strategy that we think can get to that top 10 goal trying to reflect what the data says, what the trends say, what the best practices are, and also what, what Michigan's good at and what we can do better at. When we do this plan, when we develop it, what comes out immediately are some common characteristics that top 10 states have uh, that we could emulate. There are things like, they're usually pretty competitive places uh, to do business. They're not necessarily the lowest cost places, but they're pretty cost competitive and they're in the game at least. They don't, they don't get uh, knocked out of consideration because they're just so far off the map. They're cohesive and what we mean by that is, is that they tend to be very, uh, uh, there tend to be places where you would not know that there are any disagreements about their economic policy or their commitment to economic growth. So they don't have public arguments over whether they're gonna offer economic incentives or not for business. They don't have public arguments over whether or not it's good to have a, a competitive cost environment. They, have, uh, they don't have a lot of public fighting like we tend to have sometimes in Michigan on issues like that. They're distinctive in the sense that they recognize that there are some things that they have that are better than others, they do better than others, and they invest in those types of things. The best example I can give you that we do in Michigan is we recognize we've got great natural resources that are good for attracting tourists. And so we have really stuck behind the Pure Michigan campaign now for a number of years, but that's really an exception. Uh, there aren't many other examples like that in Michigan that we followed for a long period. There are places that are innovative. And what I mean by that is, is that they really embrace the importance of having a very highly educated and skilled workforce. They recognize that they earn more money their folks, their workers have to be, offer more to the employers in terms of what they bring to the table and they are prepared to provide the resources and support to make sure the systems are there to do that. And they embrace the importance of research and development and having great universities and making sure that they thrive. Most importantly though, they embrace these precepts over decades, not just year to year. And this comes back to the election that we're gonna have here in a couple of weeks. Michigan tends to have uh, an economic policy or philosophy that varies every time a new governor comes in office, every time the legislature changes. And I think the reason for that is, is that we have not been able to, for whatever reason, build a shared agenda among folks like are in this room today that we are demanding of the elected leaders as opposed to waiting for them to come up with whatever their philosophy is and then that becomes the policy of the state. And that's something that we've been working hard on over the last decade to try to turn around and change. The plan we came up with, the plan for a stronger Michigan that you've got at all of your, 
your seats is pretty simple. And it's simple because it takes the approach that a business would if they were facing the kind of situation that we have in Michigan. The first thing they would do is they'd want to make sure that they are able to be competitive from a cost standpoint. They'd make sure that they had some resources to invest in things that really would enable their long-term growth. And third, they would deploy some really specific strategies to accelerate their ability to serve their customers. So let's take a look at where Michigan is on being competitive. So I told you in that earlier slide that kind of showed where we were, 09 versus 16, how much progress we've made. Here's examples of it. Corporate tax climate now eighth best in the country. Overall business tax climate 12th best in the country. And I could give, show you other data here too that how we brought down our, our debt levels, uh, how we've improved our ability to uh, be a more regulatory friendly environment. So when it comes to being competitive, you can almost pretty much check the box here with a few exceptions. I mean, we have really done a terrific, terrific job. So the goal is let's make sure we don't backtrack. Let's make sure we still pass budgets on time. Let's make sure that we still do multi-year budgeting. Let's make sure that we still continue to work on bringing down our debt levels. I mean, all the things that the Snyder administration and the legislature have been working on and really deserve a lot of credit for over the last eight years. So the, the, the real strategy here is guard against sliding back. That's, that's our view, at least. Second step of our plan is about, again, where would you make investments? Because you would, as a business, you, you have to invest in order to grow your company. So what do, you, what do you do? Well, let's take a look at some metrics that might give us some clues where to do that. Michigan ranks 29th in the percentage of our kids that are deemed to be college or career ready in the 11th grade. 29th. 42nd for the percentage of our kids that are enrolled in career or some form of technical education. Unbelievable for a state that makes things that we would be ranking this way. 30th for our level overall of education attainment. Now, when you think back to why Amazon didn't put Michigan on the short list for their second headquarters, these are the numbers why. Any, any major company that's looking for a skilled talent base would look at numbers like this and be scared away. So we think talent is a big issue and we think it comes down to basically three pieces. First is we're not getting the level of outcomes that we need from the K-12 system. There are probably a lot of reasons why uh, for this, but uh, the part of the reason is we've not all been on the same page in terms of what we expect and what we think needs to be done. So the good news there is, is that we've been fortunate to be part of a very large uh, group of organizations that have come together and formed a coalition called Launch Michigan. And that coalition has been around now just for a few months. Uh, we are all about trying to make sure that we have one agenda for education reform, not 50 agendas. We've already agreed on four priorities that we think are the places to start where we'd have the greatest impact. First is, what do we need to do to make sure that we give teachers the most support, the best development programs that we possibly can, because the teachers are the most important thing in the classroom that we can have? The second thing is, is that we got to make sure that uh, we're, we have literacy front and center, and that we're doing everything we can to make sure our kids can read, to enable them to be able to pursue their education and training. Third is that we have an accountability system that is there for students, for teachers, but for all parts of the system, not just uh, those folks, but superintendents and districts and the legislature and the governor, anybody that touches the system, we need to have standards and accountability to how they're all working together. And the last is, is that we have to look at school finances, which includes looking at how we spend the money that we're spending currently. We're about an average perform, average spending state, but we're not getting average state results. We're getting below average results. So we have to look at that before we conclude that necessarily money is the issue. So the good news is K-12 is now really seriously beginning to be addressed. Second thing, though, we think is important is college affordability. Uh, we've been big champions of trying to uh, tr turn around this uh, situation that Michigan has kind of created over the last decade or so where we disinvested more from our higher education system, Michigan did, than just about any state in the country. And it's a reason why tuition's gone up. 
I mean, really, the colleges have taken an unfair beating in Michigan uh, from folks feeling like the tuition has just been wildly raised uh, for no good reason. The reason is because it's almost dollar for dollar that the state pulled out the money uh, from the universities. And they're actually, it's, it's a miracle they're doing as well as they are, uh, given that situation. The good news is, is that, you know, the cuts have stopped. There is some reinvestment that's been happening, but not enough. And we need to really work on that going forward. And then the third is, is that uh, we still have a job training system in Michigan that probably isn't as uh, effective as the best practice states. There's a lot of work being done on it. I know with the Marshall Plan that the governor has and many efforts at the local level, but I think if we're honest with ourselves, it's still a very decentralized, localized, kind of balkanized system. And when it comes to really being able to grow your economy, we need a workforce system that works much more cohesively than we do today. So the message I think for all of you in this room is, is that we need more educated and skilled talent. We can't get in the trap of saying all we need are more kids going to college or more kids going to vocational education. In a state of 10 million people that's not growing, demographics getting older, we need more of both if we're gonna fill the jobs that we're businesses and our, our communities are trying to create here. The other part of the investment issue really comes down to infrastructure. And if you look at the report card that the civil engineers give us, it's not a real pretty picture. Uh, it's not real pretty anywhere in the country, but it's not, not pretty in Michigan specifically. And even on some of the metrics that are outside of the traditional things you think of with infrastructure, like broadband, we have a lot of areas in the state that aren't uh, having the service that they really need. So this is an area where we do think that more money is needed, and specifically we think that we need to raise user fees pretty substantially. Uh, most estimates say that the roads need about $2 billion more to be uh, at the level of quality and sustainability that we need in Michigan. And there's probably about at least another $2 billion worth of infrastructure needs that are going unmet with our water systems and the like. So, you know, our feeling here is, is that this is one I think we're just going to have to really bear down, uh, come up with some creative solutions, but the net net is going to be, it's going to require uh, more revenue from all of us uh, to fix this problem. And then the last part of our agenda really comes down to, again, much like you would do in a business, what are the specific business strategies you're going to put in place to grow your business, and in this case, grow the state? Well, we've got some great assets here to work from. We've got the 10th best level of patent, and, which is a great indicator, a indicator of innovation in the country. We have the fifth highest level of research and development that's being done in a university system uh, of any state. But we think that they were probably not leveraging some of that innovation to the degree we could. This chart really tries to simply say, and I'll just you know, say what the message is rather than you trying to read it is, we are doing a really good job of outperforming the nation in terms of the what you would consider to be established uh, industry sectors, automotive, manufacturing, uh, things like that but we're underperforming the nation in terms of the growth of a lot of the newer parts of the economy that relate to technology or, or uh, high tech. And the issue that we have with that is, is that the, the so-called old economy, the manufacturing economy, has been terrific for Michigan, but we've really relied on that a lot the last seven or eight years to kind of rebuild ourselves. It's unlikely that that's gonna be able to sustain that level of growth in the future, we've got to have these newer sectors pull in their weight more, and we're unfortunately not getting that to the degree we'd like to see uh, in our state. So the, the, the policy prescription here is, again, pretty simple, which is one, let's make sure that we uh, have a very consistent level of support for economic development in Michigan and that we don't keep reinventing our strategy and philosophy every other year. We don't go from you know trying to just help startups to just helping established businesses to just helping people out of state and just helping people in state. We need to help them all. And the other is, is that we've got some very specific assets in our state that we need to embrace. We need to be doing everything we can to grow. And, and we did this research a few years back and identified six assets in Michigan that we think are absolutely critical to our long-term uh, health. First is uh, we have this great engineering talent base. And engineering is a skill, a talent, 
that is going to be needed across industry sectors for the foreseeable future. Yet many of our engineering schools in the universities and the colleges and the community colleges are at capacity. So we ought to be doing everything we can to expand those programs, to get more engineers here so that we're a place of engineering talent that companies and businesses want to come here to take advantage of. We've got the single largest trade border in North America over the Detroit River. And it's terrific that the Gordie Howe Bridge is going to be built and we're going to be able to take more advantage of that. But we ought to be doing things that capture a lot of that trade that's happening and make sure that we can uh, add value of that for that trade here in our state rather than having it just be a pass-through. So for example, we should be doing things like building logistics trade parks, growing and training the, the workforce that can work in the logistics industry going forward. Third opportunity we have is around uh, the issue of our, uh, our auto industry. And the auto industry is, is transforming radically, as you know. This is an area where the state has made a tremendous amount of investments recently in the American Center for Mobility down at Willow Run Airport into a testing and validation center. We've got Planet M, which is a branding campaign that will hopefully position Michigan worldwide as a place where this is going on, but we need to continue this through election cycles. We've got opportunities, for example, with our natural resources beyond tourism. So think of the agricultural community that we have in Michigan and what can we do to attract more of those food processing operations to occur here and on and on. The idea is, is that we do some things better than other folks that the world needs that we can take advantage of, but we've got to focus our efforts just like we did with Pure Michigan for travel in some of these other areas as well. So again, a pretty straightforward plan, not real complicated, uh, but something that I think that most folks don't recognize is the role you can play in helping us kind of push these ideas forward. You know, I always say that you know, if, if a legislator gets 10 phone calls, they think they got a crisis. And people unfortunately think that, that, you know, that calling your legislator anymore doesn't matter. And, and that is the absolute farthest thing from the truth. It absolutely matters. Or to get your organizations that you belong to engaged in a conversation like this. So we've got a little uh, media campaign going that uh, I'm going to leave you a little bit of a, a commercial advertisement, and then we'll talk a little bit about maybe how you can help as well. Let's see if this will work. There we go. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at strongermichigan.com. So we've got a ton of information at this website, uh, even down to uh, whether how, how well legislators that are, or people running for the legislature are aligned with this plan. So if you're kind of curious to see where your uh, folks, the candidates for office stand, this is a good place to go to. But you know, here are some things that you could do uh, that could really be helpful. And you know, th again, these are pretty straightforward, but you know, the ones that I would really call out to you is that if you're part of an organization beyond the Lansing Chamber, that you think maybe can get more involved in this kind of discussion, uh, please have that conversation with them and let us know if we can help try to get you the information you need to be able to have that. Uh, talk to your legislators or people that are running for office and ask them questions about where they stand on issues like this. Are they prepared to put the resources into the, fixing the roads? Do they really understand how bad our talent needs are right now? And what are they prepared to do about them? Things like that, uh, I think, will really get a lot of attention. So I just want to wrap up by saying, first of all, or again, that uh, I really appreciate the work that uh, you all do, uh, the, the friendships that I've had in Lansing for these many years, and uh, the great work that this chamber does, and through Tim and his leadership, uh, is just terrific. So. Again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Doug, we can't thank you enough for sharing the plan sure, with us, but sure. most excitingly, uh, I think this uh, region and this area 
really needs to respond well to this plan because we've got to do this together. Yep. And with your leadership and your organization's leadership, I think we can get her done. Great. We can. Thanks, Thanks so much. You're All the best. Yep, you bet. <clears throat>